I, I remember some years back, he said, you know, I've got another car stuck back in the barn. I may do something with that one day. So, you know, just, just stick with me. And I thought, okay, you know, here's something that I can give back to him. We just want to give him something that as a keepsake from us that he can do for his son because I'd love to do it one day for my own son. A couple of years ago, we brought this all up. We were kind of talking about it and he goes, Oh, man, I'd love to get that old car out, fix it up, but I, you know, I don't have the time, don't have the money. It'd probably never happen. And I said, oh, well, yeah, maybe we can't do that. And uh, so got a hold of Wes, and, and the rest is kind of what you see here. He's like, well, I got a project back at my shop that uh, I think you should come take a look at. And I walk in the door, and I see this AMX, and I was just thrilled because, you know, I've always liked these cars. It's a kind of a, it's a neat feel good story, you know, giving back, you know, not, you know, someone who's helped you over the course of time. And even then, but you know, through the years of, of the economy up, down, back and forth, uh, he's always been there for me. Just even as a guide, hey, here's some things in business I'm looking at. Well, I, I respect his opinion like I would my own father's. So when he approached me about doing this project, I was I was ecstatic. What do you give the best friend, you know, mentor, a guy with a ton of wisdom, what can you give him back? Well, when he comes to you and says, I've got a project that I want done, you give him everything you got. I've got an opportunity to introduce you guys to the man who has brought us all the way out to Lincoln, Nebraska in the middle of December to work on a special project for not only him, but uh, something that has a lot of, well, I guess, a special appeal to you because you're helping out somebody who's helped you out over the course of uh, the last 20 years or so, you've said. Wes, aka Pro Header on the AutoGeek.net forum. Wes, how did this all come, to, come about? Oh, some years ago, the doctor, uh, Dr. Hendrickson contacted me about doing some uh, drag rig works on a, a Novi had. So he brings it down and he says, you know, I've got certain things I want this car to do and I think you've got the, comp the, the qualifications to do it. So when we got together, we kind of bonded really well. He believed in me and I, I took that really to heart. You know, you've got a regular customer, then you've got customers who are really good friends. So when we really started getting this together, we did the project on the Nova, it, it ran well, it, it still does to this very day. And uh, I, I remember some years back, he said, you know, I've got another car stuck back in the barn. I may do something with that one day. So, you know, just, just stick with me. And I thought, okay. And even then, but you know, through the years of, of the economy up, down, back and forth, uh, he's always been there for me, just even as a guide. Hey, here's some things in business I'm looking at. Well, I, I respect his opinion like I would my own father's. So when he approached me about doing this project, I was, I was ecstatic. You know, here's something that I can give back to him that I could absolutely care less about the money involved. We just want to give him something that as a keepsake from us that he can do for his son because I'd love to do it one day for my own son. No, very cool, very cool. So you, it, it's it's a kind of a, it's a neat feel good story, you know, giving back, you know, not, you know, someone who's helped you over the course of time. And what I think is unique is the fact you reach out to the guys on AutoGeek.net, you went on the forum, and you posted a challenge to Mike Phillips. Yes, I I, uh, I found AutoGeek.net some years back. Uh, just kind of wanted to do stuff on my own and really know that what I'm doing is correct. And Mike Phillips appealed to me through his autogeek.net videos, his how-tos. You know, some people just want to throw stuff up there, but it's not professional on YouTube. Mike's presentation, how he breaks down what he does is so important to the guy who doesn't know anything. You know, Mike takes those basic steps. He doesn't take anything for granted when he's doing things. And for a guy like me who wants to make sure that when I go to my wife's brand new Tahoe with 5,000 grit sandpaper, I want to know I've got the right technique and Mike always has it. So it just dawned on me, if I'm going to do a special project for somebody that means the world to me, I need to call the best guy I know. So I reached out to Mike through the forum. I threw it up in the thread. Hey, personal invitation to come out and get on a project that nobody's ever touched. This isn't factory paint. This isn't something somebody's been driving. I'm talking about straight out of the booth, a virgin paint job, custom paint, very well laid, very well planned out paint precision that, that uh, Ben from No Coast Custom did for us. And it is absolutely beautiful. 
So how do you think the, you know, the process is going or, or, or the pr process will be done? I mean, you, it's, a, it's a lot of man hours involved to do it and you've got some volunteers coming in. It, it, it's a big project to be taken on, especially by people that you're not familiar with working with before. Correct. Uh, here at our place, most guys come in and help me part time at nights because most of us work during the day and we want to spend time with our families. But in this this time of year, as you said, Nebraska, cold December, you know, we're all looking to hide inside somewhere, kind of get to ourselves, kind of a man cave, if you will, and just kind of bench race and hang out and do what we love to do in the hobby. So I've got about three or four guys that are behind the scenes that really make this place work. I'm just a guy that, you know, gets some of the, the credit, some of the glory, but it's truly a team effort, just like you see with my and the, and the guys that have volunteered to come out, I have no way to thank them as much appreciation as I have for what they're doing for us. Well, when we leave here by the end of the day, you've got a lot of work ahead of you and you've got a short deadline. You're talking, you know, for Christmas, this thing's to be done and you've got basically a shell of a car. Where do you go from here? Where do we go from here? The, the big question is, how much dedication have we got? Everybody's dedicated 100% to get this car back in one piece. What most people don't realize is you're only seeing one piece of the car. We've got things that powder coat, we've got things that chrome, we've got you know wheels and tires. The best part about it is all that stuff will be back here by next week. All we have to do is come in and focus on putting the car back together because when you do one of these projects, you have to put it together first, pull it all apart to paint it, and then put it all back together. What's so awesome about it is, with it being in pieces now, we can start our interior, we can start putting the drivetrain back in, the rear end, these kind of things, which we have on the other side of the shop, and it makes it real simple to bolt in. We lay out a game plan. Certain people have certain things they have to do. One person's on one end of the car, another team is on the other end of the car. We brought an in-house seamstress and an upholsteress. She's actually gonna make our stuff right here with us. Nice. It's not like any other shop where people are, you know, hey, we've got a schedule this with the upholster. When you have to start subletting things, you're at the mercy of someone else. We have just developed a program over the last four or five years where we want to do as much in-house as we can, what we like to call a turnkey operation. Okay, so you've done something like this before. Yes, we've done projects like this on the other side of the shop. We've got an LS1 swap in a Nova. Uh, we've got an LS1, or I'm sorry, an LS2 Chevelle we've done for one of our guys, Jeff, who is actually our tuner. Uh, Jeff is also hands-on. He's been here for almost 12 years right along with me. Again, one of those guys behind the scenes that you never really see, you never really hear about, unless you do some local car show stuff. We're, we're pretty well known. Are you nervous as this thing comes together? No, 20-hour days are normal for me. You know, if you read the forum, uh, the other night, I left everybody a post where, you know, I started my day at six and I quit the next day at 2.30 in the morning, went home, was back in here at six. It's dedication. I mean, again, what do you give the best friend, you know, mentor, a guy with a ton of wisdom, what can you give him back? Well, when he comes to you and says, I've got a project that I want done, you give him everything you got. Oh. And, and if that includes bringing in more people and a more team and, and experience, that's what you do. When it's all said and done, all these weeks, months of no sleep, hard work, dedication, what will be the payoff for you when it's all said and done? What will make you say it was all worth it? Oh, uh, just the friendship that we've gotten is going to continue. I mean, you know, cars are great and, and presents are great, but it's the relationship and the fellowship that we have amongst each other. I mean, look at the team of people that's involved in this thing. You know, we're just a small shop in Lincoln, Nebraska, but people like Mike Phillips, they take on the invitation. Yourself, you know, complimentary or champion for 2012. I'm, I'm ecstatic that a guy like you would stop come out, get involved in our project, let people know that small things like this happen all over the place. We don't need a big TV show, but we just need people to know that we're dedicated to do what you see everybody else do. So a simple smile on uh, Dr. Ron's son's face, that'll say it all. Oh, that's, that's more than enough for me. The opportunity itself presented itself uh, was enough for me to know that he had enough faith in me through the years of ups and downs and business great and business bad and what are we going to recover from. Uh, when you know you've got a pillar in your life like that, it's hard to replace. So when you see that emotion come out on the day of presentation, I'm actually going to take my two sons with me as well and my wife. And uh, when the car's given back, I want them guys to know what it's like to pass that something on to your son. That is a very cool, very cool project you've taken on and your attitude and everything is, is pretty inspiring. I think just about everybody involved in this project and, I, and hopefully that moves forward and it's something that I'm glad to be a part of and I know Mike's glad to be a part of and everybody at Auto Geek Time that is as well. So man, thank you for bringing us out, buddy. Oh, I appreciate it. Wish awesome. you the best of luck getting it finished. I can't wait to see the reveal. All right, man, Mike, back to you. 
Hey, while the guys are at break, I want to recap the process we're using to put a show car shine on this freshly painted 1969 AMC AMX. We're here at ProHeader Systems. We were invited here by my good friend Wes Collins to help him put a show car finish on this car that was just sprayed last weekend using House of Color paints. Now what I'm going to do first is I'm going to recap the process we're using. Now the process we're using isn't the typical body shop process because we're going to take this to a higher level and that's going to mean a few more steps but the results are worth it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take and tape off any high points using the 3M vinyl tape. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hand sand this using 3M 1000 wet dry paper to remove all of the orange peel and really get this surface flat. And the reason I want to do this is because what we're going to try to do is get a show car finish and what that means is we want maximum DOI. DOI stands for distinction of image and if you're looking into a mirror, a mirror is 100% distinction of image. It reflects you perfectly back at yourself and in order to get a paint finish to maximize the DOI, you've got to get it completely flat and that means removing any kind of surface imperfections, dirt in the paint and orange peel. So that's what the goal is to remove the orange peel, maximize DOI. So I'm going to tape off any of these high points, I'm going to wet sand with 1000 grit, knock down all the orange peel and then I'm going to re-sand with 1500 grit and the purpose of redoing it with 1500 is to reduce the 1000 sanding grit sanding marks so they're more shallow. And then after that, I'm going to machine sand this and I'm going to use the Trizac 3000 using a DA polisher. And I'm going to follow that up with the Trizac 5000. And again, each one of these sanding steps, the idea is to replace the previous sanding marks with a more shallow sanding mark. And the ultimate goal is to make the compounding step when I remove the last step of the sanding marks to make it fast and easy so there are no more sanding marks. Then after I compound it, I'm going to put the paint through two more polishing steps. Now at a body shop, they usually wouldn't put this kind of time and energy into a finish because a lot of times it's just collision work. But this is going to be a show car finish, so we're going to do these extra steps. So the first thing I have here is this is the 3M blue vinyl tape. Now this is quarter inch and what I want to do is I want to take in any of these high points, like here's a raised body line. I've already taped off the ones coming around the back window right here. But we want to tape these off and there's two reasons for this. One is to protect them so even if I'm very careful there's always the chance I could run the sandpaper or the machine sander over that high point where the paint is thinner. And I want to protect that because I don't want to sand and make the paint too thin there because then I can risk burning through when I do the compounding. So I'm just going to take the blue vinyl tape and when you're taping things off you want to pull out a small measure of tape here and this is very flexible and I'm just going to start it, push it down real hard. I'm going to bring this down, I'm going to use my finger and I can actually feel where the high point is. I'm going to press this down and cover this raised body line and this is going to protect it but the other thing it's going to do is this going to make it visually easier for me to see where the body line is because as you're sanding the clear coat as it's sanded off as you abrade it it turns white. Now this is called your sanding slurry and as this white slurry gets all over the paint it can be more difficult to see where that raised body line is. So I'm going to go ahead and break it there. Now I've got that one taped off. I'm just going to continue this around the back edge here. And this is really flexible and so it makes it real easy to follow curves and contours. Now up here where the emblem goes, there's a raised body line here too. So I want to get in here and I want to cover this up. So I'm going to anchor it, pull this out a little ways and then I'm just going to start contouring this to that raised body line. And because the inside part of this will be covered with an emblem, I mostly just want to cover the outside edge about an eighth inch with this quarter inch tape. Okay, just 
just like that. And again, because it's vinyl, it's easy to contour it. Let me get it there, come up here and just break that free. Okay, there I've got a visual indicator where that raised body line is and I've protected it from the sanding and the compounding process. So the next thing I want to do is I've already wiped this clean so there's no dust on here. I've already put a couple pieces of 1000 grit sanding paper in here. Okay, so this is the 3M 1000 wet dry paper. So I'm going to take a backing pad and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to fold this around the backing pad and pull it tight just like that. And now this is ready to go to work sanding. Now the way I'm going to sand this is called the crosshatch pattern. And a lot of people will sand with all their different grit levels in one direction and that's a time proven method that works. But the problem with that is, is it's possible to put deeper ruts in if you continue sanding in one direction. So what I'm going to do is I have a clean water source here and there's a little bit of soap in here. What the soap does is it lubricates the surface and it keeps your paper from clogging up so it'll sand cleaner. So I'm going to spray this down and I'm going to take and uh, sand in kind of an X pattern. So I'm going to start out and I'm not going to sand in a linear direction with my uh, sanding pad because you've got these edges here and they will tend to put deeper grooves in also. So I want to turn it just a little bit and then sand. And when I'm sanding, I'm going to take and I'm going to keep my strokes very close together, a tight pattern, fairly fast hand movement. And I'm going to sand this section here about 40 passes. So that would look like this and then I'm going to change directions. Okay, now I'm going to change the directions, add a little more water, and this is the X pattern. And as you can see as I'm sanding, this is the white slurry I was talking about. Now what that is is actually clear coat paint. Now on the car the paint is clear, but when you abrade the clear paint, it turns the particles opaque. And that's why that shows up as a white, it looks kind of like milk water. That's called your sanding slurry. Now I'm going to take and squeegee this off. And I think you'll be able to see where the orange peel starts and where it begins. And if I did everything right, the orange peel will be gone here, but you'll still be able to see it here. And then of course I'll continue around the car removing all of the orange peel. So that has been sanded with 1000 grit, all the orange peel's gone, the next step would be to move on to the 1500 grit. And with the 1500 grit, I'm going to refine my sanding marks, leaving a more shallow sanding mark pattern. So let me get the 1500 grit, and then we'll pick up right there. Okay, I've basically duplicated that first step, only this time I switched over to the 1500 grit. Okay, and then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and wipe this off. And this is now ready to machine sand. Okay, so the goal here is we've replaced our 1000 grit sanding marks with 1500 grit sanding marks and this should sand out fairly easy using P3000 Trizac sanding disc. So let me go ahead and get my sander ready. I'm going to machine sand this section next. Well, we're here with AutoGeek.net helping in the heartland and we've got to meet a guy here who's uh, responsible for the beautiful paint job that was laid out on the 69 AMX. Ben from No Coast Custom and Rod Shop. Ben, man, how did you get involved in this project? Because it's something that, uh, it's not normal, I guess. It's not a normal client request, I'd imagine. No, no, it's not. Um, well, I met Wes about six months ago. He just showed up at my shop, never seen him before. 
walks in and he says, hey, I can see you got some projects here, you know. He's like, well, I got a project back in my shop that uh, I think you should come take a look at. So I followed him over here and uh, he didn't even tell me what the project was going to be or anything. And you know, I walk in the door and I see this AMX and I was just thrilled because, you know, I've always liked these cars and uh, it's not a car you see every day. So, you know, I, I was really happy with that. Um, so he kind of gives me the lowdown and says, you know, what we're looking to do. And then he, I didn't even hear the whole story up until a few months ago. Um, and actually he dropped the car off about a month ago to my place and gave me the rundown. And um, after hearing the story and what was gonna go on, uh, I was really thrilled to be able to get this done in one month for him. Uh, it was a lot of hard work though. Uh, you know, I've heard guys talking about the paint that was sprayed on this thing that there's really flawless and it, it with a vehicle like this, it, you know, that can be hard to do is put on a coat or, you know, layers of paint that are, came out that well and it takes that little work to actually make it professional finish on it, you know. So what was involved for you in terms of product and um, the application process? Um, well, the application process is just something that I'm used to doing that's, it's everyday stuff for me because uh, I've been doing it long enough. but. As far as the house of colors, I, I think that stuff lays out nice. Uh, it turned out really, really well. It's definitely one of my best paint jobs, that's for sure. Um, no pressure, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you got an expert detailer coming out to finish you finish the buff on this thing, cut, sand, and buff it, so no pressure at all, right? Exactly, and you know, I really wanted to make it look good so I could show off for everybody, but uh, no, I'm really happy with the products that we use. Um, I'm glad Wes introduced me to the house of color stuff, told me, you know, that's what we're going to use because normally I'm a PPG guy, but this stuff, you know, it's great. No, no, what did you use in terms of clears? I, I know, you know, factory vehicles have next to nothing. Something like this has got to have a ton of clear so you have something to work with. Uh, yeah, we actually went with four coats of clear just to give us enough room to cut and polish. Um, I wasn't for sure, you know, what we were going to start cutting with. Uh, so we started with thousand, but there's plenty of clear on here for that. So, so you know, it gets to the point where you've got it done. Typically, when you do your own projects, now you finish them yourself. Yes. Now, you, instead, you're coming on, we're doing some live feeds, we're doing some video footage of this thing being finished, you're handing over your work to other people. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Uh, I wasn't too thrilled about it at first, <laughs> uh, I will admit, but after meeting Mike and the crew, and you know, I, it's just turned out to be a great experience. And when I, I came in here with an open mind, you know, maybe I'll learn something, and, and I have. You know, I really like the Mazurna stuff, um, the Flex polishers, they're great. Uh, you know, I'm like I said, I'm really happy. So, from a, a professional standpoint, you're able to take something away from this. Mm -hmm. From a personal standpoint, what do you take away from a project like this? Um, I, you know, I would love for my dad to do something like this for me, or you know, even opposite, I'd love to do something for my dad like this. So, I think it's it's a, a neat project all the way around. I think it, each one of us kind of touches a chord of some respect of giving back to other people who've helped mm -hmm. us over the years. And uh, to me, it's a neat just to be a part of something like this. I, I'm sure you feel the same. Oh yes, yes I do. Um, it was neat to meet the doctor, get his side of the story, and you know I like hearing all the little stories with this car. I think that's really cool how you know just it's played out in their family, so. You know, is this your first time being part of an overhaul project like this? Uh, to this scale, yeah. Um, you know, the deadlines and things like that. Usually overhaul projects take quite a while. I mean, usually they'll spend six months in a body shop, but this project we have quite the deadline, so. Well, and you know what's unique is a lot of times, I'm sure you get people coming in wanting to do a project and it never gets finished. Correct. You know, unfortunately that's the way things, people run out of time, they run out of money, they run out of desire. This is gonna get finished, so you're oh, gonna yeah. see the fruits of your labor unveiled on Christmas. Yep. That's gotta be a cool feeling. Oh yeah, it'll be really neat, and I'm gonna try and be here till the end, you know, getting it finished with Wes and his crew, and uh, no, it'll be really cool to see it finished. So. Well, thanks for being part of this whole process, man. I really appreciate it, and the efforts that you put in to uh, be part of all of this. Uh, we all appreciate it. Thanks. The next step is I'm going to refine the 1500 grit hand sanding marks by switching over and machine sanding. Now to do that I'm using the 3M P3000 Trizac disc and what I have here is a 3M backing plate hooked up to a DA polisher which I'm using as a DA sander and I have a half inch foam interface pad here. And what this interface pad does is it has some cushion to it, so it's gonna allow the sanding disc to conform to the curve of the panel. Also makes your sanding experience a lot smoother, a lot more enjoyable. Now it's important to take and line that up so no part of the foam backing plate sticks out past your sanding disc. 
Again, I'm back to my clean water source. Put some directly onto the Trizac sanding disc. And you wanna keep this thing rotating. So I'm gonna start it at the four setting. And if I find that's not fast enough to keep the disc actually rotating, not just jiggling, then I'll go ahead and bump up the speed a little bit. And what I wanna do is make slow overlapping passes going in two different directions and refine these 1500 grit sanding marks to 3000 grit sanding marks. And as you can see, I'm back to this white slurry that's a sign clear coat is being sanded or abraded off. And I wanna go ahead and just wipe this off. And if I've done everything correctly, not only will I have refined my 1500 grit hand sanding marks to a more shallow level, but you can actually start to see some of the gloss come up and reflectivity as the sanding marks become more and more shallow. Now, sometimes people would stop right there, but 3M has just introduced a brand new 5000 grit sanding disc. So this is the new 5000 Trizac. And I've got one already set up down here on another sander. Ready to go. Again, it's all centered up. I'm at the four, I'm at the five setting, and I found it actually to keep that pad rotating on this vertical panel, I actually had to bump that up to the six setting. And one of the things you want to do in your machine sanding is you don't want to keep this in one place too long, you'll remove too much paint. So you use a fairly brisk arm movement, and again, making your overlapping passes. And then again, the goal is I'm going to take and refine this 3,000 grit sanding mark pattern up to 5,000 grit. Now you're seeing the white slurry here, but you're seeing a lot less of it. And of course, that's because you're not being as aggressive in your sanding process. So you're gonna see less paint coming off. And I can see the lights in the building now reflecting through this sanded paint. So it no longer just looks sanded, it's starting to actually have a sheen to it. So it's starting to actually get some gloss to it. The next step will be to take my sanding marks out. And to do that, I'm gonna use a rotary buffer with the wool cutting pad and the Menzerna FG400, the fast gloss compound. We're here with AutoGeek.net, helping in the heartland here in Lincoln, Nebraska, doing this overhaul project on a 69 AMX. And one of the reasons why we're here is the man I'm sitting next to, it's Dr. Ron. Dr. Ron, thanks for coming uh, over here this morning. You're welcome. All right, so I need to get some backstory from you because this is your baby that we're working on doing this overhaul for your son. So take me back in time a little bit as to how this whole project, well, this vehicle came into your possession. Well, um I have a history with AMC racing uh, the AMXs. You know, when I see a National Dragster cover sit, sitting out, you know, and it says Pete's Patriot, I think there's a little bit of a tie in here. Can, I, can you explain a little bit what's going on? Well, uh, one day a friend of mine, Mike Peterson, came to school. This when we were in high school. and said his dad wanted to form a car club. Was anybody interested? Oh, yeah. You know, everybody's interested, you know. Sure. And so what it boiled down to B was that Mike's dad was an American Motors dealer. He bought us a brand new shiny 1968 AMX and we campaigned it in stock. Okay. We were a bunch of high school kids. We had our little bowling shirts and our saddle shoes and we've got best appearing crew about everywhere we went. And one day a guy walks up and says, my name so-and-so, I'm a 
a manager at American Motors, would you guys like to go racing in style next year? And well, sure, you know, what do you got? But what he had was one of 53 AMC AMX Super Stalkers. And you know, about three weeks later, one of those shows up in Kearney, Nebraska with spare engines and everything. Wow. And, and so you're a high school kid at this we're point. We're a high school kid. So you're living the dream. We're living the dream. And uh, Lou Downing was a, was a guy in Kearney who had raced Hemi's Greg raced Hemi's for quite a while and was a personal friend of Pete's and uh, so we got Lou talked into driving this thing for us and we got it all blueprinted and ready to go and uh, we won the Superstock um, division in Division 5 in 69 and remember back in those days that was before Pro Stock and so Superstock was the Pro Stock Very then. cool. and so we were racing guys like Sox and Martin and guys like John Hagen Judy Lilly, all those kind of people. Legends of the sport, and you're doing it as a teenager. We're doing it as a teenager. Wow, that's a great, that's a really cool experience. It, you know, you're a humble guy. You never mention that unless you, I see a, a picture on the wall of National Drag Show. I'm a drag racer, so I imagine you know that's going to put off, set off a spark in my head. And, and I'm, I'm glad you got a chance, a chance to share that. That's some pretty cool stuff. And that picture you're talking about is a blow up of the cover of National Dragster. It, uh, the reason we made the cover was because we were the first AMC car to win a points meet. And it was up in uh, Donnybrook, up in Minnesota. And uh, I think we actually beat Judy Lilly at the time for that. And uh, she had an AMX too, by the way, at that time. And um, so it was a big deal. And uh, then we run it up in Indy that year. And so we had a pretty, pretty, pretty special year. Um, we raced it one more year, and then uh, the guys kind of all left for the service in college, and then and, and Gene kind of lost interest. And, and so we sold the car. The car lives today. And we're trying to get it back to Kearney and put it in a museum. Uh, it's a little different than it was back in the day. They tubbed it and put an automatic in it, and they're trying to get it all back to what it was. But, but it's it's a, it's a, one of the first original uh, super stalkers that AMC built. Yeah, and I, I've seen the model car. It looks pretty cool. You know, is that representative of how it was back in the day? We were as exactly like it was back in the day. And, and uh, Gene passed away all uh, four or five years ago, but he did live long enough to see that car as a matchbox car and as an American Thunder model that you see. And uh, I was really happy that he lived to see that because uh, he was such a neat guy. And so what he did is take, he took a dozen high school kids, gave them a car and told them to go have fun. And it, it, his point was to keep us off the streets and give us something to do. I think he was kind of preaching to the choir because I, I, that dozen kids that that's, uh, started with that, not all of us are, are brown anymore, but, um, Every one of them is a productive member of society. I don't think there was a, a derelict in the bunch. <laughs> so, whatever he, if he, if he had a hand in that, and I think he did, uh, you know, we, we were very, very fortunate to have that opportunity. Never, never in the world would you ever be, as a teenager, involved with factory sponsorship, and and and, and it's, it's like being a bunch of teenagers having Warren Johnson's Pro Stalker. I mean, it's the same same deal back in those days. That's amazing. And to have it immortalized in terms of a, of a matchbox car and a die cast replica of it, that just makes it all the cooler. You yeah. know what I mean? It's something that'll live on forever. And, it, and it's a semblance of the experience you had as, as a teenager that most people would dream of and never get to experience. Yeah. At least I, I mean, that'd be an ultimate dream for me. And here I'm at 38, still trying to chase that dream, you know, so I can appreciate how special that is. Yeah. Good special deal. And I think that got pushed over onto my kids because they're all kind of AMC uh, uh, knowledgeable, let's put it that way. The middle son particularly really wanted an AMX when he got to be 16. So he looked all over the country for an AMX. We found one in Quinter, Kansas. Okay. And so we flew down and took a look at this thing. We had to land in the pasture in <laughs> Quinter, Kansas, about, about a thousand people. But this car had been in storage since about 19... 72 or 3. It had shag carpet in the back. Oh, it wow. had little fuzzy dice hanging from the, <laughs> nice. from the mirror. And it hadn't been started. This was like in 92 or so. So it hadn't been out of the storage for that long. And uh, we decided that it was a pretty good car. And and so I went to Napa. And we bought a dozen fuel filters because I knew the gas probably wasn't very good. And told these kids to set out for home. And we're, they're about 400 miles from home, you know, at this point. And uh, they made it. They had changed fuel filters about three times, but they got it home. And uh, the rest, this is what the car looked like when 
when he got it home. So, oh, very cool. Yeah. So, this was was this his first daily driver as a, yeah. as a teenager in high school? His first car. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So, my understanding is this evolved. He what went away to school, and Dad mm. decided he wanted to have a toy of his own. Is that what the story that I was told? Well, we decided that this car wasn't good to take down to university and park in a parking lot. We sure. figured it'd be stolen and uh, or vandalized. Uh, so he had an old blazer that we he took down to school. And so we parked this in the garage. And when he was in high school, I threatened him a couple of different times. If he didn't take care of this car, that I was just gonna put a cage in it and race it. <laughs> and so when he was in school, that's basically what I did. I put, I put a cage in it and bracket raced it for, oh, three or four years. And, and it just I just didn't have it quite sorted out. We needed better brakes on it and a few things didn't roll well. And uh, so then we put it back in the garage. My brother is quite a, uh, well, he's a drag racer too, but he's also kind of into pulling pickups. And he stole everything off of this car that, <laughs> that could be used in a pulling pickup. My MSDs, my carburetors, all that kind of stuff. And so it sat there in the, in the Quonset for, uh, I was 94 up till uh, uh, about 18 months ago when I called Wes and said, hey, let's fix this car up, so. Now, it, well, since this car vanished, so to speak, on your son, did he inquire as to what happened to my baby? I mean, Dad, you stole my car? Oh, I mean, he, was any of that going on? He knew it was down in the barn, and, and uh, he every once in a while, he would search the internet for AMX stuff, and he'd send me some pictures and stuff, and, and uh, but he's uh, uh, got three little kids, uh, uh, like uh, under three years old, uh, and so he's pretty busy right now, and a couple of years ago, what, brought this all up, we were kind of talking about it, and he goes, oh, man, I'd love to get that old car out and fix it up, but I, you know, I don't have the time, don't have the money, it probably never happened. And I said, oh, well, maybe we can't do that. And uh, so got a hold of Wes, and, and the rest is kind of what you see here. So he has no idea that this overhaul is happening to his, not, his old car. Not that I'm aware of it, and, and I talk to him frequently, and I think if he knew about it, I, I would I know about it. Uh, his older brother doesn't even know about this, and uh, the younger brother is here with me and he knows about it, but uh, uh, not, not everybody in the family even knows this is happening. So we're trying to keep it under wraps. He may Google search AMXs and come across this, but if he does, it's gonna be as big a surprise to him then as it will be when we give him the car. So. Now, when is the goal to have the car completed by? Uh, we want to present this on the 23rd as I'm going up there. And uh, as I told Wes, I don't think it'll mean much. I, I take. The trailer up to his house a lot because we take stuff for the kids swing sets and get furniture and all that kind of stuff so me showing up with a trailer on is not going to have any significance really to him okay. whatsoever uh, but when we roll this car out i think it's going to be pretty special now so what is your goal for this thing when you decided okay we're gonna after i stole my son's car i beat it to death then we used it as a parts car for everybody to borrow stuff off of okay at that point you said all right well i'm gonna do a make good what did you want what was your vision in terms of a finished vehicle what, what do you want to see what i what i had in mind was uh in carney we have a cruise night every summer and uh, anybody that has those kinds of things, you know, the, the good old cars just come out of the woodwork. And my idea was to have something that we could do for cruise night. And I think they have that up in Rapid City also. And I wanted something that was drivable. Now the motor that's in this car is essentially a super stock motor and I still have the motor and I'm gonna use it in something, uh, but it's not drivable really for, for a kid that's grown up with a car with a computer car. Right. And so I said, let's get something in there that's gonna be and sound nice, uh, run good, start when you want it to start, you know, that sort of thing. So we decided to put the LS1 in it. And then Wes found me an LS1, and this has been, a, like I said, about an 18-month project. And, okay. And so the whole idea is to have something that, that drives. So yeah, I think what you should do at the end is put some uh, shag carpet in the back, some furry <laughs> dice hanging from, just for nostalgia's I'm sake. I'm looking for fuzzy dice. you, you got to at least have fuzzy dice. Yeah, yeah. yeah i gotta, I got to do that. You know, we have some hot pink seat coverage just for fun. Well, what we're going to do <laughs> is uh, this kid is, is Nebraska football crazy. And uh, this is no back seat in these cars. And then the back cover is going to be either leather or vinyl, but it's going to have the uh, Nebraska Black Shirts logo is embroidered in that. So it's going to have a kind of a theme That's very on, the, cool. on the inside. Yeah, as soon as you said Nebraska, I pictured the, the black, the black shirts, That's, it all kind of ties in. That's why we went with black, nice. basically. Yeah. Now, you know, are you someone who's familiar with the detailing, with the stuff that goes on in terms of getting this kind of a finish out of a vehicle? no idea that this, well, I did sort of because I have a buddy that builds street rods and, and he has like a 46 Ford that has like 13 coats or something on it, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, but he drove it over to my house one day. I live in the country, 
And so the gravel, he took a rock in the front brace right about there and it chipped that paint job and he was just sick because he was going to have to like, do the whole car again, you know? And uh, so I, I, but I'd never seen it done. And, and, and I thought when we talked to Wes about this, he'd get a couple of cans of Krylon and just spray it. And we'd be <laughs> I'm done, a master you know? of Krylon. It's, just, it's amazing what you can do with it, but it doesn't look like this. I'm, uh, I'm joking, of course, but this is very interesting and, and, and a lot of fun to watch. And, and I really think it's going to be uh, quite a deal that that purple, protective tape. I think we've stumbled across something here. I think some purple pinstripes on this car would look pretty nice. You know, and when I first walked in and saw Mike, you know, taping stuff off, I'm like, wow, that's a nice pinstripe he's doing there. You know, I'm like, I didn't know he was a striper as well as a detailer, but you know, little, uh, the little that I know that was just a protective coating he was putting on at the time. But I think yeah. you're right. I think there might be something to do with that. Wes and I have had several uh, uh, discussions about how we want this car to look. I'm old school and I want big tires in the back and I'm not too much into the low profile, big wheel thing. And I think that's one of the things when they've done the new Camaros and the, and the new uh, uh, Challengers. Challengers and that sort of thing, that it's one of the things that doesn't make them look right, <laughs> especially the Camaros, is they got too big a wheel on them. But that's just me. I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I, I understand where you're coming from. You know, I kind of, it loses some of that muscle car feel to it yep. that it should have. And I agree with you on that. So we expect some big tires in the back of this yep. thing is what I take. It, it's going to have a good sound to it. It's going to be something drivable. Now, is it going to be something that he can race and do some bracket racing with him his own if he wanted to? Uh, or is yep. dad going to steal it and take it to the track? Well, <laughs> the, uh, my, my brother chastises me for putting a six speed in it. He thinks it ought to be an automatic so we can do just that. Um, however, it's going to have Caltrax and everything in the back. And so I think he bolted some slicks on this thing. I think the nose would go right up over, <laughs> right up in the air. And uh, I've often thought about putting some wheelie bars on just for effect, just, you know, drive around town sure. and have the guys go, whoa, he thinks he needs those, you know? Yeah, and, like a pro uh, street look to it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be so, cool. Very cool. But it's going to be, uh, like I say, it's, it's a driver, you know, it's something that when he wants to go to the store and get something, I mean, he just chunk in this and go or, or uh, you know, just Sunday afternoon go drive. I mean, you know, if it's if it's in Rapid City and it's snowing or salts on the street, you know, he better not have it out. But, <laughs> but other than that, uh, you know, it'll be something you drive every day. Well, I love the fact that you intend this thing to be a driver because that's the way I think all cars should be. You know, why bother trailering trailering it around? Why bother you know having a museum piece? Let's enjoy it. You know, yeah. you have that show car look. That's for sure. I don't I don't think that's good. Without question, but can you maintain it? Well, I don't know, but you know what? It's for sure fun trying. Yeah, and uh, you know. With, with knowing uh, uh, the painter and all these people, if we have a chip, we can get it fixed. It's, yep. it's not a big deal. Yeah, and I'm sure Mike uh, Phillips and the guys at AutoGeek.net can hook you up with all the right products and all the right techniques to keep it looking like a true show car finish, uh, no matter what you do to it. I heard Mike say, or somebody say somewhere that, that he talked to a client one time and asked him if he had a quart of touch-up. <laughs> That, yeah. would, that would make you stutter a little bit. Yeah, I saw Ben's heart drop earlier <laughs> when he dropped that line on him. That's, that's always a good joke Mike likes to play with people. Well, Dr. Ron, thank you for coming out. Thank you for uh, welcoming us in to be part of this project. I think it's something really special. It's something special that we like to get involved with as uh, representatives of AutoGeek.net. And, and Wes has been a great ambassador for you and for us. So I think it's a nice project for everybody to get on board with. We've had a ball doing it so far, and, and it's really turning out nice. All right. Thanks, Doctor. Yeah. We're going to check in with Mike and see where the A-team is at in terms of uh, their progress so far. Now what I'm going to use next is I'm going to use the brand new Benzerna FG400. This is a fast cutting compound that finishes out like a polish. Okay, so I put what's called a bead or a strip of product on there. And I'm going to use what's called the 10 at 10 technique to pick up my strip of product and then work it in and remove these sanding marks. To do that, you look at your pad as though this is a clock. So this is midnight, midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and so on. And your pad, when you're looking down on it, rotates in a clockwise manner. And what happens is this is spinning. If I turn this over and show you, it's gonna pull this into it instead of kicking it out and slinging it all over the place. So not only do you keep your product where you want on the panel, you look like a pro doing it. Now the Flex PE14, one of the cool things about this is you can turn this down to the one, which is 600 RPM, and that also makes it real easy to pick up your product without throwing splatter. So I'm gonna pick up my product, I'm gonna spread it out, I'm gonna make some slow overlapping passes and pull these sanding marks out. Okay, we're locked in. Picked up my strip of product. Spread my product out. 
I'm going to bring up my speed. That's the three setting. That's 1200 RPM. I'm going to apply some pressure here. I'm pushing down, I'd say about 20 pounds. I'm holding that pad flat against the paint. And what I'm trying to do is get those abrasives to engage the paint and take little bites out of it. And that's how you level the paint and remove your sanding marks. I'm gonna take a microfiber towel, clean. At this point, I don't wanna be putting any more scratches back in. And just come down here and softly wipe that off. And then what I need to do is I need to inspect this, looking at different angles and using the lights I have here in the shop to make sure my sanding marks are completely removed. If they're not, I can always come back, put another strip of product on there and rebuff the panel. Then after doing, doing this section, of course, move on around the car. So the sanding marks are gone. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna polish the paint to a high gloss. And to do this, I'm gonna show you two different steps to do this. Again, a lot of shops might stop after one, but we're trying to create a true show car finish here. So I'm gonna show you how to use a medium cut polish followed by a fine cut polish. And for each of these, I'm gonna switch to different, less aggressive pads. So let me set up and I'll show you that. Now on camera, the paint probably looks pretty good, but for where I'm standing, looking at how the light is reflecting off the paint, I can see holograms, or sometimes they're called rotary buffer swirls. And what these are caused from is primarily the fibers of a wool pad. Anytime you're using a wool pad like this, the fibers themselves, as the rotary buffer is spinning that over the paint, they put their own cut into the paint. And that shows up out in bright sunlight as what we call holograms or buffer swirls. You'll also see this at a lot of car shows under indoor bright lights. And no, I know a lot of you old school guys, you switch from the cutting pad to a finishing pad, still a wool pad, but no matter how soft that pad is, if it has individual fibers spinning against the paint, it's gonna leave holograms. So what we wanna do next is switch over to foam pads. But I got something else I'm gonna show you. This is a Flex 3401. And instead of just rotating in a circle, it's gonna rotate in a circle and oscillate inside that circle at the same time. So you get dual actions. And this is a forced rotation polisher. So when I grab the head, it doesn't free spin. You can actually listen to this. There's gears in there. This has a lot of this is a lot of power, and it has more than enough power to completely decimate these holograms. Now to pull these holograms out, I'm gonna switch over to the Minzerna SI1500. Now this is what's called a medium cut polish. It's not as aggressive as a compound, but it has plenty of cutting power to remove the light or shallow swirls left by the wool pad. So instead of putting a bead on the panel, this time I'm gonna put my product directly onto the pad. And this is a variable speed dial, which is conveniently located as you're holding the tool right there where your thumb will be positioned. So I can spread my product out at a low speed. And then as I'm ready to go up, just simply flip the dial and bring this up to a high speed and polish out all these holograms. Okay, now that I've got my product spread out, bring my speed up.
Now you notice I was using an overlapping motion, overlapping by 50% and going in two different directions. And this just ensures I remove all the swirls over every square inch of paint. Now I just want to come down here, softly remove this. And each step as you work through this process, you need to do two things. Bring up the quality of your microfiber towel. Only use things that are soft and plush. Fold them four ways to spread out the pressure of your hand. And you also want to bring up your level of carefulness, okay? Clear coats are scratch sensitive. If you're not careful and you wipe in a haphazard way, you can actually reinduce light marring. That looks beautiful. Now we have a swirl free finish. We put it through multiple processes, but we're not done yet. If you really want to bring out the maximum gloss and clarity, you can still switch over to an even softer pad, okay? This would be a, fall, a finishing pad and to a less aggressive product. For that, I've got the SF4000. Now this is an ultra fine polish. I'm just gonna again take and put some right onto the face of the pad. Turn my speed down and I'm just gonna repolish this one more time and after that, this will have a guaranteed show car swirl free finish. Okay, fresh clean microfiber towel. Come down here and gently wipe this off. Flip to the dry clean side. There we go. And that's now you remove orange peel through the hand sanding process, followed by machine sanding, then using a rotary buffer with a wool pad and a compound to pull out your sanding marks, and then use a machine to polish to a high gloss using two different polishes and two different foam pads. After this, the next thing would be to do is wait till the manufacturer recommend, recommended waiting time, which for this paint system is 90 days, and then you're ready to put on a coat of wax or a synthetic paint sealant. And after this, it's time for us to get ready and knock out the rest of these panels.